The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God so that you might be filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things which we have forgotten. Therefore, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to study your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and let her in if she wants. Somebody's outside. All right, turn in your Bibles to John 3.1. John 3.1. Here it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees, that means he was a religious leader, very legalistic, whose name was Nicodemus, a member of the council. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, this means he came to him and said to him condescendingly, Rabbi, and notice he says Rabbi, which means teacher. He does not call him Lord, as Nicodemus is not a believer. Rabbi, we, that is, we Pharisees, Know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miracles that you do unless... Now this unless is a third class condition. This means that he has some doubt about our Lord. And in fact he does not believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Unless God is with him. Jesus interrupted and said... Now. Jesus interrupting this man shows a lot of people like to show Jesus as some uh, sweet, mealy mouth person who would never confront anybody. But this is Jesus, and he interrupts this man, and he says, This is truth or doctrine. Unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then Nicodemus, in his sarcastic manner, said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time, can he? So what happens here is the religious man, the legalist, the first thing he thinks about is the womb, going back to the mother's womb. He is not thinking about spiritual matters such as that the uh, to be uh, born from above is a spiritual birth. It is not a physical birth. But in legalism, he goes right back to the womb and thinks about conception and going through those stages and being born physically. And therefore, Jesus continues in 3.5. Jesus, he ignored the sarcasm at this point, and he goes on with points of doctrine. If somebody is ever sarcastic towards you about doctrine, ignore the sarcasm, don't get frustrated, and go straight to the point of doctrine. That is, if you're a pastor teacher. If not, then um, you might just want to keep silent because they're not going to listen to you. Jesus answered, This is truth, doctrine, unless a poor person is born of water. Now, what is water? Water has three spiritual connotations. And Jesus says this because he knows that Nicodemus is of the Pharisees. And they studied water. And water has three spiritual connotations. First of all, for salvation in Isaiah 55, 1. Water for salvation. And this is something that uh, Nicodemus should have understood, being that he was a Pharisee and studied Isaiah. So water has three spiritual connotations for uh, salvation in Isaiah 55, 1. The water of the word that's found in Ephesians 5, 26. And the Holy Spirit that's in John 5. 739. Now the water of the word is in view here. In 1 Peter 1.21 we are said to be regenerated by the water of the word. And that is specifically the water of the word is the gospel. So what we have here is Jesus Christ talking about the water of the word, which is the gospel of Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That is the water of the word. Then we have the milk of the word. Eternal security is the milk of the word. 
rebound and keep moving, or 1 John 1, 9, that is the milk of the word. And then we get into the meat of the word, and that is dikaiosune, capacity righteousness, versus adikia, which is wrongdoing. And you might not understand that yet, because that is the meat of the word, and we'll get into that after this basic series, because now most of us are probably only ready for the milk of the word. So therefore... <clears throat> Jesus Christ says to Nicodemus, he says, uh, he answered the truth, the doctrine, unless a portion, person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of flesh is flesh. Now what we must note about flesh is that all of us here made of flesh will die. We will all die. But what is born of the Spirit is spiritual. Now the Spirit never dies. So when it says we are born again, and we are born again by faith alone in Christ alone, you have to understand that that spiritual birth never dies. In other words, we never lose our uh, uh, spirit, and therefore we never lose our salvation. And then Jesus goes on to say, Do not be shocked that I said to you, you must be born from above. Now, Nicodemus did not understand this. In fact, God the Holy Spirit in common grace did not reveal this to him because he was negative toward the gospel. He wanted nothing to do with the gospel. And in fact, his only purpose was to uh, get at our Lord. But our Lord came back with doctrine and truth. And therefore, he said, you must be born from above. Now, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are born again. And one thing you must understand about being born again is that you cannot be unborn. When you are born physically, you can't be unborn. Now, you die eventually, but that doesn't mean you're unborn. Now, the spirit never dies. And we are, when we are born spiritually, that means regeneration, believe in Jesus Christ, and you are born again. You never lose that. You cannot be unborn. You are born into the family of God, and that's the way it is from now until forever. And you cannot lose that salvation, no matter what we do. And to think that what we can do can cancel out what Christ did is complete blasphemy. We are born again. Not meaning that we will have a sudden change of lifestyle. Some pastors will try to say when you're born again, you are born into a new realm in which your lifestyle will change. You'll give up the cigarettes, you'll give up the booze, and you'll go on and uh, do some other things that you'll give up, and you'll do good works, and you'll witness to a hundred people a day, or whatever. And this is not what born again means. Born again means to be born again spiritually, simply through faith in Jesus Christ. It does not indicate a new lifestyle. This is energy of the flesh. The term born again means that we are born spiritually, and this was done through grace and not from ourselves. If you believe, you are born again on the basis of the work of Christ on the cross, not on the basis of your works, not on the basis of your integrity, not on the basis of what you do or what you don't do. And if you believe this, you are just as dumb as Nicodemus, and you are being sarcastic to our Lord. <clears throat> now, I used to go to the conferences in Atlanta when Colonel Thane would hold a conference, and when he would talk about eternal security, he would talk about a general who would, uh, I believe it was a general and a corporal, and a corporal came into his office, one day, the general's office, not the colonel's, came into the uh, general's office and he said to him, and the gen general noticed that he was uh, going through some problems, and the general said to him, he says, well, uh, corporal, have you believed in Jesus Christ? And the corporal said, well, I would like to believe in Christ, but I just don't think I would make it. I think I would fail as a Christian. I know I would fail. I just don't stick with anything, and I just wouldn't be able to do it. So then this general, in his wisdom, he grabbed a pencil. This is a marker, but he grabbed a pencil, and he held it in his hand, and he said, Corporal, watch this. And he said, Corporal, what just happened? And he said, Well, sir, you dropped your pencil. And he said, Well, that's right. 
And then he took it and he took it and he gripped it in his hand and he glared into the eyes of this corporal. And I like that word glare. And I'll tell you about that later. But he glared into the eyes of the corporal and he held on to that pencil. And he said, Corporal, what's happening now? And he said, Well, sir, you're holding tightly onto that pencil. And then the general said, gave him John 10, 28, which says, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. In other words, when you believe in Jesus Christ, nothing can snatch you out of the hand of God. You're under His care. And that happened to this corporal. And then a couple years later, the general is uh, uh, going through, making his rounds, and he runs into this corporal. And he said, Corporal, well, how the hell are you? You know how they talk in the military. And he said, well, how the hell are you? And he said, uh, Corporal, he said, uh, General, God still holds the pencil. In other words, once you are saved, you are always saved. And there is nothing we have to do to maintain our salvation. And that is the wonderful grace of God. So now we're going to dig into the doctrine of eternal security. And we're getting into the, uh, we just left application. And now we're getting into the part where we need to take some notes. Now there are some rationales when it comes to eternal security. The first one is the virtue of God rationale. Rationale is spelled R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L-E. So we have the virtue of God rationale. Now this rationale says that God cannot cancel the 40 things that he gives to us at the moment of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. This rationale says that God cannot cancel the 40 things that he gives you at the moment of salvation through faith in Christ. Eternal life is imputed to us at salvation because the Holy Spirit regenerates us by creating in us a human spirit for the imputation of eternal life. God cannot cancel eternal life. When God gives, He does not take it back. And you say, well, what about Job? Where Job said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's talking about material things. He took away his children, and his wife was an ag to him, and he was tested in many, many ways. But Job never lost his eternal salvation, and we can never lose our eternal salvation because God gave us his perfect righteousness, and he cannot take it away. That would um, indicate that he is not righteous and that uh, he is uh, what they call, and it might be a, a racial slur, I'm not sure, but they call it Indian giver. God is not an Indian giver, and I don't mean that to be a racial slur. I'm trying to get the point across to you. <clears throat> this does not imply, however, that we will succeed as believers. That means when we have eternal security, when we receive salvation, it does not mean that we will succeed in the spiritual life or in executing the protocol plan of God for the church age. It does not mean we will become invisible heroes. In fact, most of us who have believed in Christ end up losers. But this uh, entirely depends upon our attitude toward the Word of God. The imputation of divine righteousness is the only means of justification. Justification is an eternal relationship with God based on His integrity, not ours. It is based upon possessing His righteousness. Romans 5, 1 through 3 states, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our access by means of faith into this grace in which we stand. Consequently, let us have a spree de corps. That means a team spirit because of confidence in the glory of God. In other words, church, have a team spirit in having confidence in God. In other words, church, have confidence in God because of His grace. Our relationship with God does not depend on our integrity, on our morality, or on our virtue. 
and it does not depend on our failure. It completely and totally depends on His holiness and His integrity. The very concept of eternal security is the fact that the integrity of God is at stake. God gives and does not withdraw. For you to say that He does so is for you to blaspheme. He gives 40 things at salvation, and He does not take any of them back. We have peace with God because He gave us His righteousness. We do not have peace with God because of our own self-righteousness. The things that we do do not bring peace with God. The things that we do in the energy of our flesh cannot bring peace with God. Now, Lewis Berry Schaefer, the one I read from the book earlier, was a genius, of course, and uh, he uh, was a pioneer in the study of the Word of God in his day, and then Colonel Thiem carried the torch on from Lewis Berry Schaefer. Now, Lewis Berry Schaefer was... Uh, teaching a class, and they just weren't getting what he was teaching. So he said, uh, well, I'm going to take you out on the town, and I'm going to teach you a principle. So everybody went along with him in his old car back then, 1930s, probably, or early 40s, and he's taken people from Dallas Theological Seminary who are learning to be pastors, and he's taken them on a ride, and he goes, and this is in uh, New York City, he goes to New York City, and he's going through there. And he says, do you see all these people having fun, going to these bars, all of this? And they all said, oh, yes, we see this, Mr. Schaefer. We do see all of this. And then he takes them to a cemetery, and it's Greenwich Cemetery in New York. And he had them look around, and he said, uh, what are these people doing? And they said, well, they're not doing a thing. He says, they're dead, aren't they? Yes, they're dead. He says, are they out uh, partying? No. Are they out sinning? No, they're not. They're all dead. And then he made the point to them, these people are dead. Just as when you are spiritually dead, you are dead. And it doesn't matter how moral you are. It doesn't matter what you do or don't do. You can still be dead and you will still go to the lake of fire. So that was the point he made with them, which was a very genius point. So we stand in grace, and this does not refer to our morality or our self-righteousness. It refers to the virtue of God. The Christian way of life is not morality, and that might be shocking, but it is far above morality. Jews and Judaizers can be extremely moral. We have in this Christian way of life a virtue, a virtue that is infinitely greater than morality. And virtue can only be produced by the filling of God the Holy Spirit and perception of Bible doctrine. Morality can be produced by human self-determination and in the energy of the flesh. This is why so many unbelievers have a morality that is oftentimes greater than those who are believers. Confidence in the glory of God is personal love for God the Father and occupation with the person of Christ, and that begins at spiritual self-esteem. Now these things are the meat of the word, and I'm just throwing that in there. This is stuff you can look forward to. Now let's look at, uh, this is a point seven. I don't know, I haven't been keeping up with the points, but that's okay. Just uh, put down what you can. Point seven, eternal security is defined as an unbreakable relationship with the integrity of God depending upon the integrity of God. is it, a, it is an unbreakable relationship because God will not break the relationship regardless of what we do or how we fail. Neither God nor man nor angel can cancel or destroy this unbreakable relationship we have with God. The moment we believe in Christ, God gives to us 40 irrevocable things. Demons cannot touch it, and we cannot touch it, nor cancel it by renouncing God or our faith. And we noted that from uh, 2 Timothy. You have to be extraordinarily arrogant to think that a sin or a renunciation of Christ can do away with your salvation. Because Christ did it all on the cross. 
and at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, we receive salvation, and God does not take it away. Knowing the doctrine of eternal security doesn't cause one to go out and raise hell. Rather, it motivates one to want to know the wonderful grace of God who has provided these fantastic things in grace for us because of the one non-meritorious decision we have made. To think you can help God out in the matter of salvation is arrogance. God doesn't need our help. We need His help. Point A, man's failure does not abrogate the integrity of God. Man's weakness does not cancel God's strength. To think that you can lose your salvation is to say, I can cancel God's strength. And you cannot cancel what God has done for us. And to think you can is complete arrogance. And you will never live the spiritual life. And you will die to sin face to face with death. If you think this way for an extended period of time. You must get with doctrine. And understand that we were saved by grace. And we must live by grace. Yet we are more impressed with our failures at times than we are with the integrity of God. And that is the problem. Oftentimes we are shocked by our own sins. And maybe we should be shocked. But that doesn't mean we lose our salvation. Point nine. Salvation through faith in Christ results in receiving one half of divine integrity, which is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is imputed to us at the moment we believe in Christ. And on the basis of that, the justice of God blesses us, and that is through logistical grace. That's why we have a house over our head. That's why we have a job. That's why we're able to eat three meals a day. That's why we are able to sustain ourselves, because we have one half of that righteousness. And God's justice, therefore, can bless us through that righteousness, and that righteousness will never be taken away. Point ten. It is the quintessence of human arrogance to assume we can do anything to cancel or abrogate our eternal salvation. The forty things we received at the moment of faith in Christ cannot be canceled or nullified by any failure on our part. The integrity of God is infinitely superior than any failure we commit. 2 Timothy 2, 12-13 Now in John 3, 16, For God loved the world so much that He gave His uniquely born Son, so that whosoever believes in Him shall never perish, but have eternal life. Note that there are no conditions added to this. And note what it says. Shall never perish. When you believe in Christ, if the Bible says you shall never perish, why don't you believe it? You shall never perish. You will not die and go to hell. He has you. He snatched you in His hand. And He will not let go no matter what we do. And all you have to do is believe in Christ with nothing added to faith. Now we have another rationale. That was the virtue of God rationale. There is another rationale by which uh, man is saved and by which man has eternal security. Romans 8, 38 through 39. Romans 8, 38 through 39. I have confidence that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, all the demonic powers in the world can come against you, and you are not separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And this last phrase, in Christ Jesus, is technical, which means we are in union with Christ, and nothing can separate us from the love of God, and nothing can separate us from eternal salvation. We can never get out of the union with Christ. This can also be called the baptism of the Spirit rationale. Through the baptism of the Spirit at the point of faith in Christ, Every believer is entered into union with Christ in the church age. This is called positional sanctification. 
We are positionally sanctified by the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. Now this occurs at the moment we believe in Christ. It is not a dunking of the head under the water. This baptism is done by God. It's a spiritual baptism. It means you are identified. Baptizo in the Greek means you are identified with Christ. And once you're identified with Christ, you can't be unidentified with Christ. You are stuck in that relationship, whether you like it or not. Jesus Christ is eternal life. Being in union with Him means we share His life. 1 John 5:11 through 12 This is the record. God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has eternal life. He who does not have the Son does not have eternal life. Therefore, you can take down some points. Point one, we share Jesus Christ's divine righteousness. At the moment of salvation, we share Jesus Christ's divine righteousness. That's found in 2 Corinthians 5.21. We share Christ's divine righteousness. Point two, we are accepted in Christ forever. That's found in Ephesians 1.6. We are accepted in Christ forever. Ephesians 1.6. We share the destiny of Christ. Ephesians 1.5. We share the destiny of Christ. Ephesians 1.5. We share the heirship with Christ. Ephesians 1.4. We share the heirship with Christ. Ephesians 1.4. We share the election of Christ. And we are sanct- sanctified in Christ. And this is 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 30. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 30. We are sanctified in Christ. So this is the positional sanctification rationale. Now we move on to the family of God rationale. This is another rationale for the fact that we have eternal security. Galatians 3, 26. Galatians 3, 26. For all of you are the sons of God by faith in Christ. Once we are born into a human family, we cannot be unborn or removed from that family. Once in the family of God, no believer can be removed from the family of God. So the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you are born into the family of God. More than that, believers in the church age are born into the royal family of God. Whether you succeed or fail is not the issue in eternal security. We are a royal family no matter what we do. Every member of the human race has a father and a mother. Once in that family, he is always in that family. Now your family might disown you, but you're still in that family. And you can make a, you can rest assured God never will disown you as his child, as God does not have a sin nature as many families, as every family does. So once in the family of God, you are always in the family of God. No matter how you turn out in your... halfway through. I'm sure some of you are happy. All right. Every member of the human race has a father and a mother. Once in that family, he is always in that family. So when once in that family of God, you are always in the family of God, no matter how you turn out in life. Therefore, every believer possesses an eternal inheritance. This is found in 1 Peter 4 through 5, which states to obtain an inheritance which is incorruptible. That means it can't be corrupted. And undefiled. We can't lose it. That will not fade away. Notice our eternal security will not fade away. And notice what else. Reserved in heaven for you who are guarded by the omnipotence of God. Um, How are we guarded by the omnipotence of God? Through faith unto salvation. In other words, when we believe in Christ, we receive salvation. We're in in His inheritance, and we have reservations in heaven. 
The believer cannot lose his inheritance. We cannot lose our reservation. It has been reserved for us by God, and we have an abode in heaven. Romans 8, 16 through 17. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit, that is our human spirit, that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with the Son of God. You will always be an heir of God and a joint heir with the Son of God. Galatians 4, 7. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son a child of God, and if a son, then an heir through God. Titus 3.7 That being justified by His grace, we might be made heirs on the basis of the confidence of eternal life. In other words, confidence in eternal security. We are eternally secure. The next metaphor we come into contact with is the body metaphor. The body metaphor for eternal security. In the royal family of God, Jesus Christ is the head, and every believer is a member or part of the body. So if you are a part of the body, you cannot be cut out of that body. In other words, you can't lose your salvation. Once you believe in Christ, you're a part of the royal family of God. Christ is the head, and every believer is a member of his body. This is found in Ephesians 1.22. 415, 122 and Ephesians 1.22 and 4.15 and Colossians 1.8. In 1 Corinthians 12.21 are some analogies from this metaphor. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. In other words, once you believe in Christ and you become a, a part of the body of Christ, Christ can never say, the head can never say to the rest of the body, I have no need of you. Therefore, you are eternally secure. At the time of writing, the I referred to those with the gift of tongues who tended to get arrogant over this sensational gift. And in fact, there was a gift of tongues and that gift was designed to warn Israel of the coming fifth cycle. There, that, uh, as it says in 1 Corinthians, that would cease. In other words, that gift would cease, and it has ceased. And since the completion of the canon of Scripture, the gift of tongues is no more. And if you think you speak in tongues, you are uh, definitely in the wrong. The foot is another inconspicu- inconspicuous gift. The head is Jesus Christ, that is Colossians 1.18. To the most insignificant of believers, Jesus Christ cannot say, I don't need you. Therefore, that is eternal security. So we noted the uh, body of Christ rationale. Let's look at the essence of God rationale. Because of the immutable, eternal, immutable means unchanging, I-M-M-U-T-A-B-L-E It means unchanging. Because of the immutable, eternal, infinite attributes of God, He cannot cancel salvation of any believer, no matter how gross that believer might be. Jude 24 tells us this. Jude 24. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Notice that he keeps us from falling. We don't keep ourselves from falling. We fall all the time in sin. And we fall in our flesh all the time. But notice who keeps us from falling. God keeps us from from falling. And this is a matter of grace. The verse says that God has the ability to maintain the relationship which He alone started. It was God who started our relationship. Remember, it was God who invited us. We did not invite Him. He invited us to this relationship. It was God who gave us this relationship. And it is God who maintains this relationship. We cannot destroy this relationship. We can destroy our fellowship, but we are in sanctification, positional sanctification with Christ 
and we will never lose our salvation. And while we might fail spiritually, we will never lose our eternal security. The perfect integrity of God cannot be canceled by the failure or renunciation of any believer living on earth. And we noted this in 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. Faithful is the word. If we died with him, and we have, this is positional uh, uh, retroactive uh, sanctification, we shall live with him. If we endure, that is, uh, suffering for blessing, we shall rule with him, that is, in the millennium, as mature believers. If we deny him, he will deny us. That is not, it doesn't say deny us salvation, does it? No. This is talking about the spiritual rewards, such as the crown of life, the crown of glory, those things we receive at the Bema, or the evaluation throne of Christ. If we are unfaithful, and this is the part of eternal security, if we are unfaithful, disbelieving, or faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. So right there from Scripture, we see that we cannot lose our salvation. The fact that we are unfaithful and losers does not change the faithfulness of God. Every believer is indwelt by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we will note this in the doctrine of the abode of God, which will come after the doctrine of uh, rebound, which is 1 John 1 9, which we will go over next week. According to 2 Peter 3 9, God is not willing that any should perish. Therefore, He is certainly not going to lose anyone who in the past at some point believed in Jesus Christ because God is not willing that any should perish. Therefore, he has made a system of faith, a system of perception, a, system, a non-meritorious system by which we can believe in Christ and be saved and maintain that salvation because God does not want us to lose our salvation. For it says here, he is not willing that any should perish. Now we have what is called an anthropomorphism for eternal security. Now what is an anthropomorphism? Well, there are certain instances in the... Well, the, well there are two different things. We'll get into anthropopathism next week. Anthropomorphism is when the Bible says God has a hand. In other words, uh, God being a spirit... Now, Jesus Christ has a hand because he was in humanity. And in fact, his hands were pierced and uh, still pierced. So, Jesus Christ in humanity has a body, but God the Father is a spirit, does not have a body. He is a spirit. And uh, as it says in Scripture, those who worship him must worship him in spirit. Can we see our spirit? No. And we cannot see God the Father as he is a spirit. But the Bible, in order to communicate to us, will talk about God's hand. That is an anthropomorphism. It's just to let us know that uh, this is how God is revealing himself to us. But that does not mean that God has a hand. An anthropomorphism, this is the definition, an anthropomorphism, that's spelled A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-M-O-R-P-H-I-S-M. This ascribes to God a human characteristic or a part of the human body which God does not have. But it is used to explain a point of divine policy to us in terms of the human anatomy. In the Old Testament, the anthro uh, the anthropomorphism is found in Psalms 37, 24. Though he falls, this is the believer's failure, though he falls, he shall not be completely cast down because the Lord is the one who sustains him with his hands. Notice, it is God who sustains us even when we fail. That's grace. Point three, in the New Testament, the anthropomorphism is found in John 10:28, and that's where the general said no one should snatch you out of my hand this is where it says I give to them eternal life they shall never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand this anthropomorphism says you're in the Lord's grip forever and he never lets go now we have the sealing minute the metaphor the sealing metaphor for eternal security. The sealing metaphor for eternal security. Ephesians 1.13 In whom 
when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that is common grace, in whom, when you have believed, and of course, when you believe, so kicks in efficacious grace, you are also sealed by means of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be sealed by means of the Holy Spirit? This is a signature guarantee of the Holy Spirit. Now when the President seals something, it's his signature. You have a little presidential seal and he'll do it to his letters. Presidential seal. There you go. It's sealed. And when the Holy Spirit seals us, he seals us into salvation. And we cannot lose that salvation. Sealing is the guarantee of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in common and efficacious grace. Sealing is a guarantee of eternal salvation at the moment of faith in Christ. Sealing is also a guarantee of your portfolio of invisible assets in time. Now this is post-salvation grace. This is the meat of the word. So if you don't understand it, don't worry. We'll be getting to that way in the future. Ephesians 4.30 Stop grieving the Holy Spirit of God by whom you have been sealed for the day of redemption. Now your Bible will say, Do not grieve. And that is incorrect translation because at some point we will all grieve the Holy Spirit. What it is saying is stop grieving. And how do you stop? That's who pair. How do you stop grieving the Holy Spirit? By rebound. 1 John 1, nine. So, in post-salvation, Ephesians 4.30, Stop grieving the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you have been uh, sealed to the day of redemption. Now, if you could lose your salvation, could you grieve the Holy Spirit? To grieve the Holy Spirit means that the Holy Spirit is in you. Therefore, you are grieving Him. And since you are grieving Him, you are out of fellowship with God, but you're still saved. You're still sealed with the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you cannot lose your salvation. Because, uh, as we noted, our body is the abode of God. It's actually where God resides. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this is the only age in which that occurs. The church age. So we live in a very significant and important time. And it's very important. And therefore, it, it's very important that we learn these things so that we can receive our crown of righteousness and crown of glory and all those things that we receive by uh, glorifying God. Sealing was a sign of possession. Therefore, a seal attached to something signifies ownership. If a president puts a, uh, his uh, seal on an envelope, it means he owns that. That's his letter. And therefore, we are owned by God. We are owned by God, and since we are owned by God, He doesn't just cast us aside. He holds us by a firm grip in His hand and will not let us go, no matter how much we squirm. Anything to which God attaches His seal belongs to God forever. Through the function of the integrity of God, we are permanently owned by God. Hence, the sealing of the Holy Spirit at salvation is used to challenge the believer to avoid carnality, which is the sin nature, to avoid uh, sin, and in fact avoiding it up to the point of blood as it says in Hebrews, and we'll be studying that when we get into the deeper doctrines, the meat of the word. And to avoid reversionism, and we'll study reversionism in the future. It's this, uh, uh, Baptists would say black uh, back, backsliding, but uh, it has a deeper meaning than just backsliding. Reversionism it's a deep doctrine and we'll get to it. And to keep going no matter how we fail. So I think I'll just go ahead and wrap it up now as we've been pounding away with this. There's another rationale that we will begin next week and that is the eternal security rationale. And then we'll move on to 1 John 1 9 and its importance for our spiritual life and the fact that it is the foundation. For our spiritual life. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to study your word this morning. May the things that we know help us to understand better your grace. Help us to understand that it's not dependent upon us for salvation, but dependent upon you. 
and help us to learn to understand that while we were saved by grace, we have a wonderful life to live by grace. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.